Hello everyone, welcome back to the workshop. Today we are looking at another dial laser and this time it is the Sculptfun S30. This is the five watt version in the S30 series and we're gonna take a look at its features, what it has over the S10 series. There's a couple of additional features included in this that we're gonna like. And so if this is a laser that you're looking at or just curious about, stay tuned, we're gonna jump right into it. All right, now I'm not gonna go over the whole build of this. There is a really good manual provided with it. It has in multiple languages and there are many of photos, step-by-step -step instructions. For the most part, this walks you through it pretty well. They also have assembly videos linked in this in key steps that you can reference as well. So if you are putting this together and you're struggling a little bit, definitely reference the manual, reference their videos. But if you're hung up on something, shoot me a comment down below, reach out to me. I'll be happy to try to offer any assistance I can make sure your laser is set up. But I do want to touch on some of the key points that I found were either really good to highlight or that you may get tripped up on. So let's go through those now. As is typical with most dial kit lasers like this, they uh, include all of the hardware and all of the tools needed to put together. So don't worry about needing to buy things. However, you may find some of your own tools may work better than ones included. I'll have a few linked down below that I like to use myself. As I mentioned, the manual is very helpful. They have pretty clear pictures and descriptions about how everything goes through. They also have links via some QR codes to other videos that may help you as well. So definitely check that out. And then it was great to see that all of the individual bags per step are separated out and labeled in each step. They also include a very nice lens replacement kit. So that is one of the things that you may find is a consumable on this is that there is a protective lens on the base of the module it's actually removable and you can swap out the lens. They provide you an extra lens and the tools to do that. So something to keep in mind in your maintenance routine is to be routinely checking that as well. Everything went together fairly easily on here. I didn't have any problems with fit or finish. All the screws mounted in smoothly. And uh, I, I can't say that I struggled on any step of this. I have put a number of these together, um, so that does help, but I didn't find anything that really stood out as a problem area to me. A few things to keep in mind. Um, some of the easy things that people get mixed up on is their belt tension, uh, especially on the side ones where you put, install them yourself. You wanna make sure that once those are in and in place that you adjust the belt tension. You want the laser to move smoothly without jumping, but you also don't want it to be so loose that it can bind and twist. So take your time, adjust your belts accordingly, lock those down. And then also on your gantry wheels for the two side rails, you do wanna make sure that those are rolling smoothly and that they are snug, but not too tight, but you don't want any play. There's an eccentric nut on the bottom wheel that you can adjust with the open-ended wrench that they provide as well. A couple of things to note, same as the last Sculptfun laser I reviewed is that it does have an adjustable acrylic eye shield. You can adjust it with the two thumb screws on the side to flip it up, get your focus block in there, and then put it back down and you can raise or lower it just in case you need to have a little more clearance or not. Those are adjusted from the side. Now the overall focus of the laser is handled by two screws in the back. You loosen up those thumb screws and then you can move your focus up and down by moving the whole laser module. And that is where you would use your aluminum spacer that needs to sit up onto the bottom of the actual module itself, not the acrylic shield. And then you tighten up those two thumb screws. I do find that these thumb screws being in the back and being kind of small are a little bit fidgety to work with. I'd love to see them more on the sides or accessible from the front, but they work fine. Just take your time, make sure you get them both snug down. The limit switches are the one thing that isn't documented too well in the manual, but they do have a really good video that you can watch to step you through them. They have mounting holes on both the X and the Y rail as to where they need to go. And then you need to route the wires along the channel and then into the control board. They provide some tape that allows you to secure it to the back of the rails. That seems to work okay. I don't know that I have a better solution for it, but it does seem a little bit odd. Uh, just make sure you're checking the tape every so often that it's not interfering with any of the part, moving parts on the laser. And then along the side uh, where I have the rest of the wire loom, I went ahead and used some of that extra tape and just to strap that wire to that wire loom all the way up to the control board. They do provide labels on every one of the wires that helps you make sure you get them plugged into the right motors and the right connectors. So just pay attention to those and you shouldn't have any problem with that. My only other concern with the supplied material is the air hose. It's the same one as on the S10 and it is a larger diameter and more flexible type of air hosing. And it comes coiled up in such a way that it gets some kinks into it. 
My concern is that those kinks could actually collapse through movement of the laser, restricting your airflow. I haven't noticed that being a problem. It's something to keep an eye on. And if you do find that's an issue, you could source your own silicone tubing as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what you can expect to be able to do with the SculptFun S30 five watt diode laser. First and foremost, you're gonna to need to run some tests to make sure the laser is operating correctly and that you can get a baseline for some of the materials you're working with. Now they do include some nice sheets of eight inch or three millimeter plywood. This piece, they came with about three of these pieces and this one is three cores. It's got a light interior. It is 200 millimeters by 300 millimeters or roughly seven and seven eighths by 11 and three quarters inches. This is far more material than is provided with most lasers. Most of them give you these small business card size pieces of plywood, maybe one to three of these. And so it's really nice to have some extra material right off the bat to help you dial in your initial settings for the laser. So with that being said, let's take a look at what we got out of this machine when we started those tests. So I run some material tests. I do an engrave and a cut. And so this was the piece. The engraving is on top, the cut test was on bottom. And of course, this is with the provided material, that three millimeter or eight inch light plywood. And so what we can deem from this is that for cutting, our power is gonna be 100 to 200 millimeters per minute. And we're gonna be right around that 80 to 90 power range for both. You could drop it down to as low as 60 uh, if you want at the bare minimum, and then up to 100% on the 200 to make sure you get through the cuts. But when we jumped up to that 300 millimeters per minute, uh, even at 100% power, it was leaving some material behind. And so that uh, would give you problems cutting. So um, I based my cutting speed off of 200 millimeters a minute. And with that, I'm running 80 to 90% power. Pretty much 90% was what gave me more, the most consistent cuts. But that is for this specific material. Now, if you go and find eighth inch or three millimeter plywood, you might use a Baltic birch that has some different types of layers or you might use some underlayment plywood that you find at the big box store. They're gonna have a lot of different variables to them. And so you're gonna to need to run this test for yourself. Now on the engraving, we wanted to find a graduated scale that gave us a very light engraving down at the 10% power on up to a pretty dark engraving at 100% power to give us as full of a range. And for some of you, you might be concerned about running it at those higher, higher power levels. On engraving, it's uh, very minimally hitting that power. And with a diode laser, if it's properly cooled and properly cleaned, uh, you really shouldn't have a problem running at 100% power. And so that's what I usually look to is where am I getting the greatest range? And on this one, it is in that 300, or sorry, 3000 millimeters a minute range. Uh, at 10% power, we just barely get a bit of coloring. And then we get our darkest dark up at 100% without getting a lot of overburn and uh, or in some cases, as you see on the thousand millimeters a minute, we are actually burning through the material. So with those baseline numbers on this material, I was able to start working on some other projects. So let's take a look at those. Knowing that we had our engraving settings at about 3000 millimeters a minute and 90 to 100% power being still decent, uh, I went ahead and ran this image mode engraving test. And this tests four different of the modes that are popular with this. Jarvis, Dither, Newsprint, and Atkinson, and it gives us a comparison of how those processing methods make the image clearer and get the various details to come out. So this gives us the different powers from 100 down to 70%. That's gonna give us a good range. As I said earlier, you sometimes will get an overburn. And so looking at this, we were able to pick out some of the ones to use with image engraving. So with that in mind, I went ahead and engraved this image. Now this may be familiar to some of you if you are a fan of fantasy and sci-fi. Uh, this is the Balrog scene from Lord of the Rings. And we are running this using the Atkinson mode. We're using 3000 millimeters a minute, topped out at 90% power. And that was based off of that image test. And I was fairly impressed with this. The details came out pretty well. You do get some variations on it where they look like imperfections, but you have to be careful. Some of that is just the wood grain of your, your top veneer that you're engraving on. So uh, another good test is to see what materials are gonna give you that great color differences and also not be popping out a lot of imperfections in them. But I was very impressed with the detail that was achieved with this on a natural surface such as wood. And so that's just one of the things about having the lower power five watt diodes with that 0.06 millimeters square focus point, you're going to get a higher detail out of your engravings. To show an even better engraving, 
in more detail, we went ahead and tried Slate. And so, of course, continuing with the kind of nerd geek theme, we've got Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek Next Generation, and this is on some natural Slate tile. Uh, again, this was ran at about 3,000 millimeters a minute, but we backed the power down to about 60% on this one. Uh, and so this was after I ran another grid test on Slate. Uh, and the nice thing about that is with Slate, once you engrave on it, you, if you screw it up, you can actually bring it out to your sander and uh, sand it smooth. That'll take that top layer off, take you down to a fresh layer of Slate. It'll be smoother, but you will be able to reuse the tile. And so the nice thing on that is you just using the engraving power of the five watt in the detail, we get a very crisp photorealistic view on this Slate tile. Wanting to test, start testing out the differences with both cut and engraving so that we could utilize that auto air on and off, went ahead and set up a quick test file using a coin, this one being a Minnesota Vikings coin. And the logo was in multicolors, so I used that to try to have different powered settings on the engraving. And it came out pretty well. I could have uh, made some adjustments to the power and speeds on some to get more clarity, but it did go through and do the engraving and then switched over to do the cut file and it worked out pretty well. Again, this is on the included sheet of that three millimeter light ply. Another example of something that can be done, we went ahead and made a uh, little keychain dog tag type thing here. Again, we engraved the Sculpt Fun logo. There were a couple different colors on there, although they came out roughly the same in the engraving and then went ahead and cut out the circle for the little keychain part and then the outer shape as well. So just to show that the five watt laser can do some cutting as well as engraving, um, you're not just limited to engraving as some people would feel these are. Continuing on with the engraving and cutting, I went ahead and used some of their included material to make a couple of small magnets. And so these are just a couple of little cat magnets. I went ahead and put a neodymium magnet in the middle of the backer, which has cut out for a quarter inch or a six millimeter magnet and then glued them together. And so they make just some cute little magnets. Again, this worked well with the engrave and then the cut option, switching the air on and off. And then also to start checking other material, we went ahead and cut out just a workshop logo. This is out of a well, five millimeter cherry. It's a little bit under a quarter inch. And these just have the rare earth magnets glued right onto the back of it. Um, of course, with the thicker material and the hardwood, I had to make a few extra passes to cut this out, but it still was able to cut through the material very cleanly. And as you can see, there's a nice charred edge on there without any gaps where I had to cut through it. So uh, very successful on cutting some slightly thicker material as well. And then of course, just to show the detail of the ability to cut, this is out of some 1 16th inch plywood or about one and a half millimeter and it's just a simple stand-up pine tree. I was able to cut out this they slot together and then slot into the base. And this was done at 250 millimeters a minute, two passes at 90% power. So again, this laser is not just for engraving at five watts. You can definitely do some cutting as well. All right, well, that's going to wrap up this video for us today. Uh, I want to once again thank geekbuying.com for sending this out. I'll have a link down below where you can purchase this laser along with the code to save you a few dollars on it. As far as what I think about it, I think it's great for engraving. You get some awesome detail out of it, and it. but it's not just limited to that. You can do some cutting as well. It's probably going to be limited to about quarter inch or six millimeter material or less, depending, maybe a little bit more, but a little bit less. Again, you're going to need to test out each material that you're working with. The linear rail, the limit switches, the auto on and off air, they are all great upgrades to see in the styled laser from earlier models and uh, without adding a whole lot to the cost. A couple things you may wanna consider if getting this in this laser is you're gonna probably want to get an enclosure of sorts unless you can run it out in open air a lot. Uh, these machines do put off a lot of smoke and debris and so you want to make sure you're not breathing it in. So a good enclosure with an exhaust fan is gonna help you out there. I'll have links down below to a few that I recommend. And if you're gonna be doing a lot of cutting on this, you're probably gonna to wanna to invest in something such as a honeycomb bed. Again, that will help you have cleaner cuts and more consistent cuts. And I'll have links to those below as well. That's gonna wrap it up for this video. I appreciate you stopping by and hanging out and uh, learning a little bit about this Sculpt on S30. If you have any questions about this or anything else from this video or my workshop, go ahead and leave a comment down below. I try to get back to them as quickly as I can. If you like what you saw here, maybe consider subscribing. 
as I do put out videos fairly regularly, and I would love for you to check those out as well. Once again, thank you for stopping by. I hope you found it informative, and I hope you can get out into your workshop and make something too. We'll catch you next time.